Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest, Roy Stubblefield, was featured on episode 257. If you haven't listened to that show, I'd highly recommend listening to it before listening to tonight's show. After Roy was featured on that show, a development was brought to his attention that's unfortunate to say the least. On tonight's show, Roy's going to tell us about the aforementioned development and talk about several other things related to his encounter. Roy, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me, Nick. Oh no, thank you, like I said, for coming back. We're glad to have you. From what I understand, Roy, you've made some progress since you came on the show. Please tell us what kinds of steps you've taken towards dealing with your encounter in a healthy way since then. Well, um, shortly after the encounter, I, of course, had to go back to nightmare land for a little while and (laughs) revisit all of that. And I found that uh, just writing, just writing, um, not going to say I'm an author, but I do write some. I haven't, don't, I don't have any published work. So I don't even think I've completed a book completely all the way, but I, I do intend to finish one, hopefully within the next 14 months. But, um, that is what helped me quite a bit as far as dealing with, with going through all of that again. Um, it has helped quite a bit, um, and I use your mantra daily. It's actually enabled me to be able to turn off my lamp that has been a lifelong friend at this point for a couple of nights a week. I haven't made it a full seven days. I think the furthest I've gotten in is about five days out of one week, but I don't have the dread that I used to have after talking with you. And as I had told you then, it it helped me a great deal just to, you know, kind of unburden myself from that because you have no one to talk to that will take you seriously and won't make fun of you. That really helps a person a great deal, especially when you know everyone that's listening is interested or and they're also a believer in uh, dog men. So that in itself is a great help on your road to healing, if you will. And my grandson, those are things that keep my mind occupied enough so that I don't have those minutes or second, few seconds in the day to where my mind, I might be standing looking in the refrigerator and move something and be like, I hope it's not a wolf head back there. Or, you know, I've, I've made great progress. And I have to say 99% of it has happened because I talked to you and the insight that you gave me on the subject. No one else has been able to even come close to telling me the things that you told me to help me deal with it. And it was more one simple sentence that you said, if it wanted to hurt me, it would have. And no matter how you look at it, forwards, backwards, sideways, at an angle, it all adds up to the same thing. If that thing had wanted to take all of us out that night, I'm pretty sure it would have did it. And if she didn't eat everybody up, then whenever the train or somebody else was going down and taking a shortcut to go to the convenience store, that's when we would have been found or what was left of us anyway (laughs) but it's been a great help I just writing has really helped me deal with it because I'm able to escape a little bit by creating something that even though it's make-believe you're creating something that you know that you can deal with this creature or these creatures if you will in case you have someone has an encounter with them but it's totally fictional so I don't have any concrete evidence that anything that will work that I'm writing about. So 
it's helped that and I've also given thoughts into creating a podcast of my own. I haven't decided 100%, but I'm really leaning toward it, but it wouldn't be more towards finding out about new dog man encounters. It would be more geared toward people that have had these encounters and had such a hard time dealing with them as life went on for them, not being able to unburden themselves with someone that, whether they're family, friends, or whomever, that will believe them and won't make fun of them because I'm finding that the more I talk about this, the easier it is. And I'm not going to say it's, it's you know, <laughs> a piece of cake easy, but it's a lot easier than it had been closer to the time I had the encounter as opposed to now with all these years going by because, you know, a lot of stuff you keep bottled up inside and that's not good for the human psyche at all, if you have something that's bothering you to the point of where I have to talk to somebody about this, but I need them to believe me, but I don't want them to say they believe me just to mollycoddle me. I really want them to believe me that there's a possibility in their mind. There's no possibility in my mind. I know for a concrete fact these things exist, but for a person that's never had an encounter, and if you're trying to talk to them about it, then hopefully you can open up that doorway to a possibility for them that, okay, there is something out there in this world that exists that man has not yet. Well, some men, some people know about it, but the government, for some whatever reasons they have, don't want it to be known that these things are out there. It's almost like um, as long as uh, we paying money into the government, it doesn't matter too much what happens to us. It really doesn't matter. And I find that, I find that disturbing to a certain degree, but this is the day and age that we live in. So you just have to accept it for what it is. That's all you can do. Accept it for what it is. You're right. You mentioned the nights where you still had to sleep with the lights on. When you did have nights like that, did you feel more frustrated or embarrassed? Uh, I wouldn't say I was embarrassed. I would say it was more along the lines of, well, actually, let me back up just a moment. Um, after doing that show, I still continue to listen to uh, Dog Man Encounters, of course, uh, number one show for me. But there's another guy, I'm not sure if I can say his name on your, so he has a podcast, too, that I listen to. Please do. His name is Brenton Salwin. And uh, I've made several attempts to contact him. There are some questions I'd like to ask him about a supernatural aspect to this, just to try to cover all my bases, if you will. But I listened to his show, and I listened to an episode. I can't remember exactly what number it was right now, but there was a guy backpacking across the country, and he stopped here in Phoenix and stopped at one of the urban lakes that I fish at quite a bit. And he was going to sleep there and he claims he's seen a skinwalker. And after I heard that, that light came right back on. <laughs> that light came right back on. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, no. I moved here to all the way across the country to get away from this thing. And now you tell me you got things like that down here, but these are more akin to shapeshifters, people that actually shapeshift into an animal. And I'm like, oh, man. So I, I'm i not going to say I have full-blown terror, but I did have a high level of apprehension as to if, you know, how many more of these things, you know, how many more of these things are there, you know, where, you know, are these? being seen at in Arizona and I've done a little research on that and unfortunately the results weren't that good because they're north, south, east and west in Arizona. So and that's just something else I have to deal with. But if I ever encounter one, I'm praying to God that I don't, but that's what made me turn the lights on a little bit. And then I just pretty much buckled down and said, Stop creating drama for yourself that does not exist, Roy. If it's meant for you to see one of these things, 
it's going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't pick the time, the place, or how the encounter is going to go. But if that's what's supposed to happen, if that's your path in life, then don't dread it. Just make sure you try to be as prepared as possible if that happens. So once I got done with that and kept saying your mantra, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to continue to live my life in fear of a possibility that I could see one of these things again. I've already seen one. I by looking at the body and knowing what they could do to a human person. All you're doing is creating terror for yourself that's unnecessary. Don't get scared until you see something. And hopefully try to maintain enough cool where even if you are afraid, you can still think clearly enough on how to figure out how to get yourself out of that situation. So once I did that, I just started turning off the light again and I sat there and and just was like, you know what? There's nothing going to happen. You've been here for quite a few years in this house and nothing happened. If something is going to show up, your dog will let you know that there's something outside. So just key on him. And uh, if he starts acting unusual or in a way that I've never seen him act, then I know something is up. And then I know that it's time for me to, to either have to get ready to do something or to try to remember how much gas I got in my car. So when I make it to it, I can get the heck out of Dodge. But other than that, I, I, you know, I just maintain. I, I try to maintain, and it worked. It worked. I, like I said, I had probably about maybe three days where I was really on high alert after listening to it, and then I'm like, okay, this was three years ago, four years now that this guy seen it, and it's a, quite a few miles away from where you're at. So don't worry about this thing that this guy seen, knowing you're here and comes specifically for you. And then, of course, I had to do a double check and be like, is there anything that I did to any Native Americans that would cause them to want to come and get me? And knowing that I hadn't, I was okay. And that filled that slot in. So I'm doing okay now with that because I didn't want to continue to put my mind in that place where it didn't need to go. If, you know, I got, there's other things that I need to focus on. So. That got me through those hours that I went through that. But ever since that happened, um, I'm still vigilant as always. But I try to make sure um, to remember, don't worry about that until you see something. And that's what I've been doing. And everything has been going relatively smoothly since then. It's just a shame that you have to get so far down the rabbit hole before you get enough gumption to come up out and be like, I'm not going to live my life like this anymore. I'm, I'm not. This, this is crippling and debilitating, and I refuse to live my life like that. So that's where I'm at now. I refuse to live my life in fear about a possibility. There's no rhyme or reason for it. If there's a possible look at happen, it's possible look at never happen again. But if you dwell every day on, man, I wonder when this is going to happen, then you're pretty much putting that karma out there for it to happen and that's the way i view it and i'm not going to do that i'm I'm, it's not going to do that so i just buckled down and said you know what i'm going to live my life the way i was supposed to live it to the best of my ability and that's what i do now i don't want to be a prisoner to fear anymore and now understand when i say fear i'm only talking about as far as dog men and such are concerned, because the, there's nothing else that scares me. Somebody can have a, a gun drawn on me, and I'll be like, you know what? At least I know this is going to be a quick, clean death, as opposed to getting ripped apart and then possibly eaten and deposited around the floor somewhere. So I'm not doing that anymore. It just You can literally drive yourself insane if you do that. You may not go full-blown cuckoo, but you will drive yourself to a point of mental unbalance if you continue to do that to yourself. And that's the last thing I want. And that's the last thing I need. So I'm not going to let it. It won before when I seen it because it really crippled me when I had that encounter. Where locking myself in and blocking my door and sitting with my, you know, my gun and my lap all night or right there on the bed next to me. I'm not going to live like that. I'm not, I'm, I'm too old for that. And it just, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, that could all change once I move up in the mountains, but 
for right now in the city, it's not happening. This I'm not gonna let it because it that if I continue to do that in a sense, that means that that creature won that day and is still winning today if I let it do that. So I, I'm not willing to let her continue to win like that. I'm I'm just not. I my life was not meant to be lived like that, and I refuse to let that that creature continue to do that to me. Now, if I see it again face to face, will that come up? No, I'll probably be sitting there wishing that Jesus would show up holding his father's hand or, <laughs> you know, where the special forces or stuff like that. But if that happens, that's a hill I'll deal with when I get to it. But right now, I'm not going to give it more attention than it deserves. And, and that's where, that's the point I got to where I started turning that light out. So it works out pretty good. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're dealing with it so well now and in a healthy way. To hear that you're actually able to sleep with the light off at least a couple of those nights, that's a huge win. After you told us about what happened to poor Herman during that encounter, there's been a lot of interest in finding out how he's doing. Recently, by a stroke of luck, you're able to track down his family and find out. Please talk us through how you're able to find them and what you found out about Herman when you did. Well, that, that's a, I don't know what's the best way I can put this. I found out that the world is smaller than we, than we think it is. You know, the, the normal phrase is, the world is a big place. And for quite a few circumstances, you can look at it like that. But for some of them, the world is a small place, but I'm babbling now. Um, I have a cousin that's a truck driver. And I mentioned him, uh, I believe, before when we were speaking about uh, he's, uh, he's more like a brother to me than a cousin. We grew up together. You know, we spent a lot of time together. We have mutual interests, especially when it comes to fishing and stuff. But when I moved away and he moved away, but we still stay in contact with each other on a regular basis. And after I, I had told him about this encounter, uh, when I got back to Nebraska and he was one of the few people that didn't laugh at me, he actually relayed to me something that happened to him when he was in Atlanta when he was a child. So he knows that there's things out there that and a lot of people's minds shouldn't be out there. But anyway, um, he travels all across the country. All, I mean, from coast to coast, he's all across the country. And after he listened to, uh, my encounter episode to, uh, 257, well, he called me and we had a talk and he actually called me quite late at night. I was surprised he wasn't trying to get some sleep. I know he had to get up in the morning. We talked for almost three hours and we were talking. And I was like, man, I, you know, if I could find one of them, it would do so much for me to be able to talk to them, one of them again, to talk about what happened to us, to see where they're at in their life with it. And he said, well, you know, I stop at a lot of places, man, all over, warehouses and, and different businesses delivering stuff. He said, um, and I've got a repertoire with some of the people that I, you know, stop and talk to. Some of them are repeat customers. And he said, I was trying to spread the word a little bit. He said, because, you know, don't nothing spread faster than by word of mouth. Well, his significant other had relayed to him a few years ago. Uh, that she could see spirits. And when he first told me, I wanted to laugh, but, you know, I do watch ghost adventures and stuff like that, so I know you can be attuned to the paranormal. Um, actually, when I was a child, my grandparents were, one of my grandparents and my mother and my dad were, we were talking about, they were talking about something, and I was being nosy. But, um, Evidently, one of my father's sisters has this ability, too, but they call it being born with a veil over your face where you can actually see stuff on the other side of the veil that people that weren't born with that 
you know, can't see ghosts and spirits and stuff, or she claims she does. And he was, of course, very skeptical on her ability to do that because he's like, well, you know, I don't know what, what, what kind of game you're trying to play with me, stuff like that, you know. The conversation went along about those lines, you know, where he basically didn't believe her until, uh, didn't believe it was last year or the year before. Uh, he lost his mom, I guess about five years ago. And he lost his grandmother probably about, well, grandmother passed about, hmm, I'm going to have to say it's been close to 30 years now. But they had moved. He had, they had been staying with his sister for a short time. You know, sometimes you fall on hard times and you got to spend on your family to help you. But they stayed with her for a short time. But shortly after they moved into the new place, I believe he said they were having dinner. I had just got done eating and they were sitting in the front room watching TV and she kind of looked off to the right and she started nodding her head and I'm just relaying what he told me. She was nodding her head as if she was talking to somebody, and she just ever so calmly turned and looked at him and told him, Grandmother said hi, and that there were a couple of things that he needed to do, and she was disappointed in him that he hadn't taken care of it yet. And I believe what she was referring to at the time was that why he hadn't married his significant other at the time. And he looked at her because there's no way this woman could have ever met his grandmother. She knew his mother and met her quite a few times, but he said she told him that his mother and grandmother were standing over there in the kitchen doorway looking at him, and both of them had their arms crossed, and they had that look on their face that, meaning, I'm not playing with you, boy. <laughs> and there's a uh, name that she used to call him that only a few people know. I think other than him and her and me, there may be three other people that have heard her refer to him as this. But she never knew this word. And he's like, well, what did my grandmother used to call me when I was little? And she looked over in the corner and then looked at him and told him what it was. And it was man. When he was a little boy, his grandmother used to call him man all the time. But he didn't like it because... I'm not sure why he didn't like it, but he just didn't like for her to call him man. She wanted, he wanted her to call it by his, his name. So when he, she said that, he looked at her and was like, there's no way you could have known that. And she pretty much told her, well, grandmother said this, and grandmother said that, and that's what made him believe. So getting back to where I was at, um, he talked to her and told her, about what happened and actually asked her to listen to the episode. And after she listened to it, she started making phone calls. Now, I know she has a big family. She has family in Arkansas, Louisiana, of course, Texas, you know, a lot of the southern states, Mississippi. And she started making some phone calls. And she just, you know, was putting the word out. If you guys run into somebody or one of these guys that uh, know it, the the key phrase was, if you know a guy that's got a white spot in his hair, but his hair is still black, it's not gray. If he's got a white patch in his hair, then, you know, can you please contact me because we're looking for him, but his name is Herman. Well, she got a phone call back, I'd have to say, two weeks ago now, maybe a little longer. And it was one of her cousins that knew a girl that was dating a guy who said, his father had a white patch in his head. And she said, I'm talking to her, trying to get, you know, uh, her number so that we can talk. And then maybe, uh, you know, I can call you three-way and we can all have a conversation to find out if this is the person. Well, you know, I kept my fingers crossed. I was just thinking, you know, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to be able to find any of them guys. I'm, I'm just not. And even with this age of, Twitter, Facebook, and Skype, and uh, all these other uh, public uh, sites you can go to to try to find somebody. I'm like, that's like looking for a needle in a really big haystack. Well, I wasn't able to make contact with any of the guys that were actually there with me, but she found Herman's son. I've never met this young man before. Never met him at all. I, you know, did give it a not a lot of thought, but I'd say in 
a few uh, spare moments that I had over the years. I'd be like, I wonder whatever happened with Herman's son. I wonder how Herman's son is doing. How did that all go? Well, she convinced him to talk to me. At first, he was very skeptical because he does not believe in dogmen. He does not believe in Sasquatch. He doesn't believe in demons or angels, but he believes in God and the devil. So I, I'm not sure how he can skip over everything else and, and go to the other two, but some people are, they are able to do that. Well, she finally convinced him to have a conversation with me. And the first conversation we had, we talked through three way. And he's a little arrogant. I'll, I'll give him that. He's a little arrogant and. But I don't know him, and I don't know what he had to go through in life, so maybe he earned that right to, to have that kind of disposition. But as I got to talking to him, and he asked me, I know three times, how do you know my dad? And that's when I told him, I said, well, I can tell you about what happened between with, with your dad the day I met your father, or I can have you go on YouTube and listen to this encounter that I had, and then you'll know everything that I know. Well, he rather at that time that I just tell him, and as soon as I told him the whole story, and as soon as I got done, I the attitude I got from him was, I don't believe it. But I asked him if we could have another conversation, and we did, and... I talked to him some more, of course, but he's still standing. He At that time, he was still standing firm on what happened. I believe it took a phone call from him to his mother to kind of open up that door to, okay, maybe this guy ain't crazy. Maybe what he's telling me is the truth. But nothing in his life prepared him to hear something like that because evidently his mother didn't believe that. I think... If I remember correctly, I'd have to get my notes out. But I believe that he, she told him, she believed that his father had taken some kind of hallucinogenic drug at the time that this happened and that this is what he's seen and that it just didn't, it was too strong for him or something like that. Even though she got six people that told her almost word for word what happened to him. Her mindset was, I don't believe in these things, and I found that really weird, especially since she was from Louisiana and should know about all the crazy stuff that happens down there. Well, I think it was our fourth, it was our fourth or fifth conversation as to where he was willing to tell me what happened to his father. I'm sorry, give, give me just a minute because this is still a little hard for me to talk about. Take your time. <sighs> Herman, Herman's no longer with us. He, he never even seen his 30th birthday. And he did not have the remind, the remainder of his life was not good for him in any way, fashion, or form. According to his son, he was really mad at his father because he felt as if while he did have a father, he didn't have a normal father, which led to him to not have a normal childhood. I can understand how he felt because if my dad hadn't have been the presence in my life that he was, then I might have similar feelings as he had. But that creature literally took Herman's mind to a point to where he couldn't even deal with everyday stuff. Normal everyday stuff that you do, Herman couldn't deal with it. I mean, he was afraid of everything. And he can only remember him to until the time he was about seven, seven and a half. And that's when his father passed. And we were speaking the other day, Vic, and I forgot to tell you exactly how he passed. His heart basically gave out. 
if he he was in his room and thought he heard something or maybe thought he seen something and his heart basically just stopped on him. It it couldn't take any more of the pressure that he was putting on himself based upon what happened. But according to his son, and I remember this is coming from somebody that only knew their father from the time to they were seven. Going to the movies, going to the mall, they would be walking across the parking lot and Herman would have moments where he was very lucid and then he would have moments where he would just shut down and he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He would just, you know, you could see um, get on his face that he was scared to death, whether he'd seen something that reminded him of what happened or smelled something, heard something. I'm not sure, but there was something that triggered him going from one phase into the next phase. And as he was telling me this, I, I haven't cried in a long time, but I did shed some tears when he was telling me. And the guy said, man, are you crying? I'm like, yeah, nobody should have to live like that. And he's like, well, you didn't really know my dad. I'm like, I knew him enough to know that he, when I first came to that basketball court, he was the one that extended the olive branch to me in friendship. I know that. So that, to that let me know he couldn't be that bad a guy. Because bad people don't do stuff like that unless they have bad intentions towards you. Now, once again, I have to go back and say, I didn't know none of these guys from Adam. So there was a possibility that they did have a nefarious plan in store for me. Thank God it didn't happen. But, you know, when you go along with the realm of the possibility, you have to make sure you don't exclude everything. Some things you have to make sure you keep included in that. But he had an absolute terror of railroad tracks especially if it was at night. Now, I'm, when I say this, I'm not it's referring to him walking down railroad tracks because he would never do that again after that happened. But if he was in a car and he would come to a railroad track to go across it, the first thing he would do was look left and right, up and down the tracks, and then he would try to scoot to the middle of the car and just basically start crying and babbling, get me, get me out of here, get me out of here, that monster, that monster. And I was like, oh, my God, are you serious? And he's like, I do remember a couple of times him doing that. But shortly after this happened to Herman, the mother of his son, she couldn't deal with his mindset. So she stopped seeing him. She didn't keep his son away from him. She just wouldn't leave him with him unsupervised. It either had to be her and his grandmother there or his grandmother had to be there all the time, which she was. And that's the only way she would leave him with his father. But I can only imagine. And no, actually, I don't even have to imagine because I, I was close to his state when that happened. I, I was close. I had to fight tooth and nail not to descend down into that pit because once you get down in there, I'm not sure if anybody can bring you back other than God. I'm not sure if anybody can bring you back. And I spent days and nights just replaying the uh, conversation in my head. And I still haven't got to the point of where I know he's in a better place. I know he's in a better place. But for what he had to endure before he got to that place, it's just, when you think about, I look at it like this. That thing killed him. It just took a long time for it to happen. Because if he had never seen that, now I can't say if they had a uh, heart disease or anything in his family that could have, you know, caused that to happen. I don't know that. But from what I do know, that thing killed him. It just took a long time to do it. He, he had to go through the meal, the processing, shipping, receiving, and all that other stuff you have to go through in order to get from point A to point B. And he was never able to get back to point B. He stayed stuck on point A. And it just, it's really sad that that happened to him like that. It's really sad. My heart goes out to him, his family. And 
the other guys. I, I don't know what happened to him now. He told me he used to talk to them until he was, I believe, 15 or 16, the other guys. I'm like, do you know how to get in touch with him now? And he said, no, after Hurricane Katrina, he lost contact with everybody. And he hasn't made an effort to speak to them again. So um, I did ask him if his grandmother was still here. And he said, no, he lost her a few years ago. So I asked if I could talk with his mom. And he said he would talk to her. And I haven't heard anything back uh, about that yet. I still got my fingers crossed that maybe she'll she'll be willing to give me some more information. Because she, of course, being an adult at the time, she would be able to relate to me. Uh, better exactly what Herman experienced, but he's upset that he didn't have a father, and I had to talk to him quite a bit in order to get him to realize that your father wasn't crazy before this happened, and I don't think he was crazy after it happened. I just think the amount of fear that he had, because he was the one that was up close and personal with this thing. I mean, he does say he remembers his grandmother telling him that Herman told her repeatedly that when that thing was looking him in his eyes, that he felt like it was taking something from him. And I don't know what that is. I can only speculate, but I'm thinking it may have been feeding on his soul. But that's my own speculation. I I don't have any facts <laughs> to uh, prove that, but that's how I'm choosing to look at it right now until I can either get more information or until somebody can de- definitively tell me yay or nay on that. But, oh, my God, I mean... I think it was bad enough that we all seen that thing and had the, the 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 time that we spent with it, I, which I can't tell you. I know it was the seconds. I know it was minutes. That I do know. But for him to not be able to to bring himself back to the point of where I got away with it. I, I'm still alive. I got away. I know I was <laughs> I was right there up under it, and it could have did several horrible things to me but it didn't do nothing other than look at me in my face but I got away so you know now I got to figure out a way to try to make sure this don't happen to me again and according to the son he was never able to to do that and I did have some moments where I was thinking you know what that could have been me that could have been me in his shoes it's just that I believe that because of my brother's and my father uh, making me, trying to make me made of stronger stuff because I'm the youngest from those six children. And yeah, my brothers bullied me, but they used to always tell me what to make me tougher. Well, I'm thinking, even though I curse them sometimes about some of the stuff they did, in some ways I have to thank them because I do believe that without them doing the stuff that they did to me, that I, Herman's situation could have very well have been mine. But trying to process that and you know, I I have my my bouts of being extremely angry. Extremely angry, but I didn't go down a fool's lane, if you will, and be like, you know what? There's no way I'm going to let this thing get away with that. I'm going to get me the biggest gun I can find. I'm going back to Louisiana. I'm going to buy me a chair and a lamp, and I'm going to post up on them railroad tracks until that thing come back. No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, not doing that. Not doing that. But I was extremely upset for a while because I don't feel like he deserved a life like that. I don't think anybody deserves a life like that after seeing something like this. But... When you've been conditioned your whole life that these things are make-believe, they're only created in Hollywood. Uh, You've probably seen a big wolf or a big dog or, you know, people trying to satisfy you with bits and pieces of what I consider fluff. 
not going to say the other word, but I'll call it fluff. You know, until you see one of these things, and especially if you're up as close to it as we were, all people can do is talk. That's all they can do is talk until they have an encounter or they see one with their own eyes. That opens up a little bit more of your mind to where, you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong and I've been lied to or I've been misinformed. I think lie is kind of a strong word when you're referring to your parents and stuff like that. So I'll say misinformed about the existence of these creatures. And once you do find out about them, of course, we talked about that too in the first interview of how it can take you to a whole different realm in your mind trying to deal with this because first you try to make sense of what you've seen and if you don't have a dad like mine that tells you believe what your eyes showed you because God gave you those eyes for so you could see stuff then you pretty much just kind of you know you muck along and you muck along and you just have all these questions about what is that thing? Why did that happen to me? And I even went down a path. Uh, somebody had asked a question from the first interview about that uh, my date did show up, and it just happened to be that werewolf. You know, for a minute, I back then, I didn't give it much thought because I had so much other stuff I was dealing with about the encounter, you know, that was like, okay, well, okay, that could be it, that could not be, but I didn't give it a lot of thought. But after I thought about that question, after we did our first uh, interview, that's what kind of made me start really wanting to talk with Brent Fallen because he's able to pick up the Bible and find stuff in the Bible that he can associate with these and break it down if you're not a person that reads the Bible every day or even if you read the Bible every day, that doesn't necessarily mean you understand what you, exactly what you're reading. You can put your own spiel on it to what you think it may mean, but he breaks it down to where you like, you know what? That does make sense. That that does make sense. So that's why I have been wanting to uh, speak with him, but I've been unsuccessful on that uh, venture, but I still got my fingers crossed on it. But poor Herman, I just, <sighs> I just think about that. I mean, I think about him every day since he told me that, and I'm not thinking about it in terms any anything negative to go along with him. It's always with, oh my God, I just. I feel so bad for him because he was so excited about becoming a father. He was so excited about that. And with the questions that he was asking me, once I found out that he was going to be a father, I'm like, okay, he's, he's scared, but he's excited because he has, he's never been through this before. So, but I could tell he was excited. Now I'm going to be a father. and Every man's dream is to have a son. But, uh, on a side note, be just as happy if you have a daughter. Those are jewels in themselves also. Um, but he, I know he was still continue to talk to the other guys because he said they was checked. They would come by and check on him. Not, not the, the son of whose name is Travis, by the way. He did say I could use his first name. His name is Travis. But they would come by and check on Herman. And, of course, they had to run the gauntlet with his mother because she was thinking that we had been doing mushrooms or acid or I think the other thing he said was something about embalming fluid. I, I have no idea what <laughs> what you can do with embalming fluid that's going <laughs> to make you see stuff. Uh, I thought that was just used on corpses. But I guess... Um, as human beings, we find new and creative ways to find stuff to put in our body to take us to a different, uh, <laughs> to find different pleasure, if you will. So I'm a, I'm sad that she thought that, especially after what they told her. And I believe that to the day she passed away, she still didn't believe that we've seen that, even though she know her son came home looking different than when he left that day. So maybe. 
with her being uh, where she is now, she's got access to more information than she would have on this plane. And she gave everybody a heartfelt apology, even though we might not receive it. She gave everybody a heartfelt apology for not believing us when we told her what happened. But if hopefully somebody will be able to find one of them. I'm still going to leave my Facebook page up and um, it's only to contact one of them or somebody that knows. I put certain stuff in there without going into great detail about who I was looking for. So if one of them do happen to contact me, uh, I'm going to do everything I can to get them to contact you, Vic, because I think that will be another great source of information to know exactly what was going through their mind when it, while this was happening or, you know, after everybody got away, how their lives were. I think it would be a lot of information that people could use going forward if they've uh, seen these things or if they haven't seen them or God forbid if they want to see them. So I'm still trying on that. I'm, I'm still trying to keep that, that open and, and hopes that, uh, one of them will contact me. But, you know, I can only imagine that ter- I know the terror that he had because, you know, as I think back about my first encounter, when I got home, I'm so glad I didn't order a pizza or anything like that because I probably would have shot the pizza man through the door. <laughs> or I would have scared to be jabbers out of him because my hand was shaking so bad, I probably would have put bullets all around him and never hit him. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I know I'm laughing now, but I'm alive to laugh at it, so I think I earned that one. But like I said, I can only we we're very akin to a certain thing that happened in our life where uh, when you consider the fear level that that we had had to endure, and I wish now more than ever that. I would have just went back the next day or stayed. I really wish I had done that. Now, I can wish all I want, but in reality, as I thought after thinking about it all these years, I'm not even sure how much help I could have been to him. I just didn't have enough worldly knowledge at that time to be able to tell him the right words. I mean... When you see something like that, even if somebody believe you and, you know, they tell you, well, it's going to be all right. You got away. No. At that time, that that, that close to when it happened, no, you are not okay. And that's the last thing you believe. That what you're going through your mind is, when is this thing going to try to track me down and find me to finish off what it started? That's what's going through your mind. So... I just still wish I would have took the time to do that. Maybe even got his phone number or something where I could have stayed in contact with him. But at that time, fright ruled everything, everything in me. And all I wanted to do was get away and get my gun and make sure I had my back against the wall for when this thing came. Because for quite some time, I was sure that it was going to come after me. Now, why that was would have been when it had me dead to right there? I don't know. You, you, when your mind, when all this is going on or after it happened, is it still so fresh? You don't think about going to see anybody unless, you know, you're going to a military base to get a, a platoon or maybe a squadron of a highly trained dudes to come back out to you with the military weapons and hunt that thing down while you sit in the vehicle safe and sound while they out there find it and you wait for them to bring the body back. But other than that, no, you, you, you want to get away. My, like, my biggest thing was I need to get the heck out of Louisiana. That, that's where I was at. But I stayed because I had to honor my scholarship that I worked so hard to get. I had to honor that. And I didn't want to, you know, just give up my education because of this thing. I just said, well, I'm just going to have to change my life and which means I'm going to have to stay out of the dark. But. For Herman to have to go through that for seven, a little bit more than seven years, and then to think that his heart just gave out because, I, well, I don't know what happened that when, you know, at that instant when his heart, you know, stopped, but I can imagine, I can imagine what happened to him. 
Now, my take on it is, is that he either was asleep and had a nightmare about it, or he might have looked out the window and for some reason seen something where those shadows can play tricks on your eye sometimes. He may have thought he seen something and figured that that thing had found him or whatever, and his heart just couldn't take any more of, of the kind of, you know, the pressure that he was putting on it. You know, you get your adrenaline flowing and your heart is pumping and everything, and you know, that muscle's really working, but it's actually working overtime. It's kind of like an engine in a car. If you drive at 100 miles an hour for so long, pretty soon your engine's going to burn up. It's just, it's just a fact. Your engine's going to burn up. So I really feel like... I lost somebody that could have been a good friend to me, but because of fear, I couldn't get back to explore that to find out if that's what would have really happened. And I kind of kicked myself, but I can't continue to do that because I'm not a doctor, not a psychologist. There's not a lot of help that I felt that I could have gave him to knock that, but you know, staying in the realm of possibilities, maybe I could have figured something out. Maybe, maybe all of us together could have figured something out to help him so that it didn't come to that. You know, you never have a normal life after that, but maybe we could have figured out a way to get him back to some semblance of normalcy in his life. And since I didn't do it, I can only speculate, and I kind of kicked myself for not doing it, but... At the time, I did what I thought was best for me. I wasn't worried about everybody else. I just did what I thought was best for me because I didn't know these guys. I, you know, we hadn't developed a, uh, any kind of other than, you know, a acquaintanceship. We, I say, I can't say really say we were friends, but we were definitely acquaintances. So I really feel bad about how, how his life turned out. I mean, I just don't think he deserved that. After what he went through and survived, I don't think he deserved to have to live his life like that. You did know things were going to play out the way they did with him, so I hope you're not too hard on yourself for not staying in touch with him. That's not going to do you any good. A lot of the people who tune into the show on a regular basis view the show solely as a source of entertainment. For someone like you who's lived through such a nightmarish encounter, what would you say to the listeners who view the show that way? Well, first thing I'm going to say is shame on you. Shame on you for thinking that this is entertainment. Because this happened to us. We, you know, there are so many other things I could do with my life rather than come on a show and give such a great fabrication about something that happened to me. I don't have time for that. Even, not when it happened, not even now. I don't have time for that. I came on because I wanted to let people that believe that these things are out there and you need to be vigilant because you never know when they're going to pop up. I always would have, I would have always assumed if that hadn't happened, if I was just a normal, regular listener and had never had an encounter, that these things were in the woods somewhere because a lot of the encounters that I've listened to People are in the woods and stuff. Now, I have heard some where people have seen in the city like I did. But if they want to think it's a joke or it's just entertainment, you're more than welcome to do that because you're supposed to believe what you want to believe, regardless of what somebody tells you, sometimes even what they show you. You're allowed to do that. God gave us that ability to make up our mind if we want to believe in something or if we want to disbelieve in it. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm still going to say again, shame on you. Listen to the fear that's in these people's voices. Listen to the details that they give you for what they've seen and what they went through. Now, Hollywood, yes, yeah, they make a lot of money. I don't know where they get the ideas for some of this stuff. I actually have an inkling that some people, the people that did the uh, Underworld series, I think somebody seen a dog man. And that's why they were able to uh, either make such a convincing creature or they went back 
to the 14th century and started doing research and started well, reading about folk tales or legends and then, you know, found some old drawings and stuff like that and came up with this or maybe somebody had a nightmare about one and thought it would be a good thing to bring to life to put on the big screen. I, I, I'm not sure how it happened, but anybody that doesn't believe, I'm okay with that. That is your God-given right. But I tell you what, and you can take this to heart. Should you happen to see one and have an encounter, you don't have to apologize because I understand. You don't have to apologize for not believing. I understand. But this is not entertainment. This is either years or sometimes less than a year of somebody seeing something, having an up close or maybe not so up close as I was but close enough where you can get good detail when you see it. But if you got that many people telling you lies about a monster, wow, that kind of just boggles my mind. I mean, there's two, 200 plus episodes and you, and you would think that 200 something people are lying about this. They have nothing better to do with their life. No, the reason we come to Vic is because he gives us an outlet to unburden ourselves as much as we can because we are having problems dealing with this. We've already went through, did I really see that? Man, did that really happen to me? We've already went through that. We've already critiqued ourselves to the point of where we're, we're to the point now where, you know what, I don't care if anybody believes me. But if there's one person out there that does believe me and I can keep them from putting themselves in a precarious situation to where they might have an encounter one of these and it might not go as well as the one that I had, if you can call that going well, <laughs> I mean, then I can just say, if this is entertainment for you, please continue to listen. We appreciate your support. That's the best thing I can say on that note. But this is not make-believe. This is not make believe, ladies and gentlemen. It's not. And Vic, God bless him, had enough either curiosity or confirmation from something that he saw or experienced or heard about that he created this platform for us to be able to do this. Or maybe he talked to somebody and was able to look in their eyes and see the sheer terror that was going on. See the hand start shaking. You may even break out into a, a cold sweat. Why are you talking about it? It all depends on how it affected you. But if you think that it's just entertainment, that's fine. And I mean, that's fine. It, it's okay. Like I said, I'm 55 now, and I don't get nothing from telling lies. I'm not getting paid to come on this show. I'm not getting paid to, to, to make stuff up. There's no money involved in this. Well, the only thing that's involved in this is my peace of mind, and that's where I'm striving to get to. And Vic has helped me a great deal on that path. I will always consider him a good friend. Even though we've never met, we've only talked, I still consider him a good friend because he helped me where nobody else could. So if you think it's entertainment, keep listening for entertainment purposes. But for those of you that believe that this happens, or those of you that know what happened to you, stand strong in your belief that that happened to you. Don't let anybody sway you from what you know for a fact happened. But still continue to listen. We appreciate that. We really do. Still continue to listen if you need entertainment on Friday night. Well, that's all very well said. I couldn't agree more. This is no joke. Roy, thank you so much for coming back on and giving us an update on what you found out about Herman. You know, I appreciate it. Well, I... I you know, Vic, I'm not going to lie to you. I was hoping that I would didn't hear anything. I had a... Not a big hope, but I had a small hope that I would put that out there and nothing would come back. Because that way I could satisfy... I could... I could tell myself everybody came through that yeah, we got battles, not, not battle scars, but we have encounter scars. But everybody survived it. We, we found a way to get through that and, and still manage to live somewhat of a normal life. And for as, as fast as it happened, 
that's what got me. I'm like, you know, that's why I always say, God, you know, <laughs> that higher power, he, if you pray for it long enough and make sure you walk the right path, he'll make stuff happen for you. He will, he, he can make that. He'll make stuff happen for you. And I can only think that God had a hand in this. He, he actually listened to my prayers or he read my email, decided it was time for him to check his voicemails, what, however you want to look at. It. But he made that happen. So the only thing I can take from that is that it was meant for this to happen. For someone to be able to find Travis, convince him to speak with me, have him do that, and then let me find out about his father. That's the only way I choose to look at it. Now, it could have happened different ways, but I choose to look at it like that. God had his hand on this. I know I read a lot of the questions that people were asking. I read a lot of the comments that people were saying they would really love if Herman would come, if I could find Herman and come on the show because I didn't think about doing that all these years. Well, I thought about it, but I never acted on it because I, like, once again, I was in working under my impression that everybody survived. So we walked away from this. And while we might have little quirks that we developed behind it, that everybody was able to at least go on living and, and, you know, try to live their life to the best of ability. And he never got that chance. Now, I understand that some people are mentally stronger than others. That's why we have people that go and fight wars for us. I mean, they voluntarily want to go into the military and know that they could go to another country to defend America, and they might be the last time that they set foot on American soil alive. But they go do that. They got that extra ick. Now, other people be like, oh, there's no way I could go on war. The people shooting at me and bombs and missiles, and oh, and there's no way I could do that. That's because you don't have that ick factor. Even playing football. A lot of people watch football. A lot of people watch football, but very few people will actually put on the pads and get out there and play football because they're not able to deal with the pain that comes from a 250, 300-pound guy that can bench press a Volkswagen, <laughs> you know, slamming you into a ground, you know, just pretty much trying to put his shoulder through your midsection and make it come out six inches behind you. It's not a lot of people that's willing to do that. You have to actually have a love for that. Now, does that mean that you like pain? Well, probably a little bit. I mean, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, you don't think about the pain. You just think about you're doing something that you love to do. You're not thinking about the consequences that's going to come later on in life behind all those impacts. You're not thinking about that. You're right. And yet that moment, you're thinking about this is something I love to do, man. There's nothing else I would rather do. I love playing football. Okay, I, I got that it factor as far as that. But like I said, sometimes you, you some people just aren't as mentally strong as other people. Or you may be extremely mentally strong and still have an up close and account. I mean, everybody that's listening, close your eyes for a minute and just picture you're on your back over a nine foot tall creature that's got his nether regions right over your face, but for a, a few seconds ago, you were face-to-face -face with this thing. You can smell its breath. You can feel it breathing. Everything. Just close your eyes and imagine that. And then you get away with your life. Somehow, you get away with your life. The thing doesn't do anything other than what I described it doing. And ask yourself, what would my mental state be after having an encounter like that. That's all I ask you to do. You can only imagine it unless it happened to you. But just imagine that happens. You take the scariest thing that you've ever encountered in your life and multiply that by 10 and then say, well, when I got out of that, away from that creature, I was A-OK. -okay. If you were A-OK -okay behind it, then you have that it factor. And God bless you for having it. But even if you're extremely mentally strong, to have an occurrence like that happen to you, where you're that close to that thing, I mean, you pretty much can count the seconds to, like, I think I got about three seconds left to live, maybe less. 
even though it doesn't happen, that's where your mind takes you. Some, even if you're extremely mentally strong, your mind can snap because nothing that you lived or experienced up to that point has prepared you for an encounter like that. So how do you deal with this is new, extremely new to you? How do you deal with something like that? So that that's what I have to say about that. I poor Herman just I'm going to think about him a lot. I know that. Um but I'm going to try not to kick myself, Nick. I'm I'm going to try not to kick myself because as I said, I'm not sure if I could have even helped him at the you know after that had happened because my, my my mind was so messed up behind it. I had great fear of a lot of stuff, especially the dark. But I managed to find a way to climb back out of that pit. I, I, I found a way, and I think you helped me make that last few feet up out of there. Now, I still do lean over and look back down in the pit every now and again, but I make sure I stay far enough away from the edge that there's no way the edges can crumble away, and I go flying right back down in there. So I just, gosh, I'm going to think about him quite a bit. But I'm going to really work on not kicking myself because there's no guarantees that I could have did anything. Maybe I could have been with him for all of those seven years and his condition could have stayed the same. I, I'll never know at this point, but just to know, to hear how angry his son is, that that, that kind of put me in a little different place. But we still talk every now and again. I've been trying to get him to come on the show and he's just, he pretty much made it clear. I, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't have time for that. I'm like, just talk. To, I said, well, just talk to, just call Vic and talk to him. He's like, what? Well, he going to tell me about my dad. He didn't know my dad. I'm like, wait, calm down, calm down, lower your voice, lower your voice, calm down. I said, you don't know what kind of help this man may be able to give you. I didn't know what kind of help he'd be able to give me either. But he helped me a great deal, a great deal, more than anybody other than I'll put him right there with my cousin as far as being able to talk to him about it and not getting laughed at or made fun of. But I don't know what other experiences that he has in life. Maybe there is something he could tell you that will make you uh, stop taking such a harsh stance on your father. Your father's not like that because he wanted to be like that. He's like that. He was a victim. And that's what happened to him. But I'm going to continue to talk to him as long as he'll allow me to, to talk to him to, because I think now I'm... I mean, without him having a real father figure in his life, I'm not trying to replace that. But he does need an older male to kind of talk to him a little bit to, to make him get rid of that anger because that in itself is a burden to him and is basically crippling him because when you're mad at somebody that you can't let them know why you're mad, well, what outlet do you have? You, you can never tell this person. Now, you can write and put on paper. You can write down on paper or start your journal or maybe even just type something just to get it out of your system. There's ways that he can deal with it, but I'm thinking right now, my impression is he's choosing to look at it like that. And it may be his form of protection for himself. I know that sounds very weird, but it may be a sort of protection for him to not open his mind to the point where my dad seen a werewolf or a dog, man, and it changed his life. It, it, it made him not my dad anymore. If he never gets to that point, I'm okay with it. I just want him to know that your father was not like that because he wanted to be like that. He just really did not know how to deal with what happened to him. None of us did. He said, well, how come you're not like that? I'm like, and I went on, on to tell him about, you know, my brothers and stuff like that and how I live my life, you know. Can't walk around being scared, stuff like that. What's the point in that? So hopefully if we continue to talk, I'll be able to light a candle in there somewhere or maybe get an ember burning that I can get, you know, to start burning a little bit brighter and brighter every time we talk to where he gets to the point and be like, you know what? I understand now what you've been trying to tell me. I really understand the message you conveyed and that I'm not mad at my dad anymore. I'm now I'm mad at that creature because I told him, you should be mad at anybody. You should be mad at that creature. That's the one that got everything started. I don't believe in that stuff. I'm like, okay, well, 
you live in Texas, right? He said, yeah. I said, you ever thought about taking a ride down to East Texas and spending the weekend? He's like, why? I'm like, just go down to East Texas and find some, some vacant land, you know, or look for some land for sale in East Texas and go down there and camp for the weekend. If you can last the whole weekend without having something happen. Why? What's in East Texas? I'm like, I'm not going to prepare you for anything. I'm only going to tell you go down to East Texas and or go up to Oklahoma and spend a weekend out in the, in the, the woods in Oklahoma. Maybe you'll see something. Maybe you won't. But if you do, I guarantee you're going to contact me and you're going to talk about it. And that's when I'm going to send you right on the Vic. Yeah, man. He's basically, yeah, man, whatever. I'm like, okay. Well, like I said, just do that if you don't believe me. So he still ain't got to the point. Of, I'm pretty sure he ain't got to the point where he's going to do that. He probably won't. Because one thing I've learned is city folk, <laughs> when uh, we stop being in the woods, we stop being in the woods. We lost all our ability to know what we can eat in the woods, how to build a shelter in the woods. We have to have somebody that actually spends a great deal of time in the woods teach us on how to survive in the woods. So <laughs> you could have something really, really close to you and never know it's there because you don't know how things move when they're in their natural environment. You know, you're in the city. When you hear a siren, you know it's either the police, fire truck, or ambulance. You hear something howl out in the woods, your mind will tell you that's either a wolf or a coyote. You never give yourself a third option, or your third option may be somebody else is out here camping and they playing a, a, a game by making these noises. You, your mind doesn't go towards, is that something other than a wolf or a coyote? But one thing I have learned is this. Every folk tale, every wives' tale has a shred of truth to it. It, it, there's a shred of truth in everything you hear, no matter how minuscule, there's a shred of truth in that. So, for those that don't believe, that's fine. But if you encounter something like this, contact Dick. That's all I'm going to say is contact Dick. But, man, I mean, I had a lot of time to think about a variety of things since we did our first interview and after reading every comment that I could and I tried to answer everybody's questions but somebody said um, they weren't seeing any of the comments so I don't know if they responded but I know when I did try they said I had to create a, a page on YouTube and I did that so hopefully once I did that you were able to hear my responses to your your questions for everyone that um uh, Felt like I ignored them. I, I didn't ignore you. I answered every question that I could because I know there were going to be questions. But people just be careful and remember everything you see, there's not an explanation for it right now in your mind just simply because you haven't been programmed to believe that these things exist. You just haven't been programmed for it. it you know, mostly uh, whoever talks about something like that, whether it be your parents or your grandparents, aunts or uncles, maybe friends, we're always told that stuff like that doesn't exist. It's just make-believe in Hollywood. That's a story that was told to frighten bad kids when they were little. No, it's way more than that. It is a lot more. As you know, Roy, there's nothing you can do to help Herman now, but you can help yourself. And you won't do that by beating yourself up over not staying in contact with them. I hope you never forget that. But having said that, thanks again so much for your time. Have a good night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.